Leadership Coordinator with Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Um, and PCAP goes around, um, around the province and we do uh, in-person speaker series. We bring an expert to come in and talk about the species that we're in, or anything to do with prairie conservation. Uh, we also do an online yes. webinar series. Yes. You can watch it from your own home or office um, on your computer. Um, today, Maggie We'll be talking about restoring a prairie icon, sage grouse recovery in the Grasslands National Park and south of the Divide. Uh, before we begin, I just want to mention that um, PCAP has a few other events coming up, so you can check out our website. We'll be um, doing a speaker series about all the good things that uh, landowners, ranchers, and farmers provide for society. Um, we'll be doing a webinar called The Truth About Cattle and Methane, um, one about grassland and carbons, uh, grazing and carbon storage, and how grazing has an impact on global warming and climate change. So we've got some really interesting events. Uh, we also have one coming up about prairie butterflies, too. Um, so these really interesting topics. <laughs> um, PCAP gets funding from Environment and Climate Change Canada, Mass Power, and Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association. And then in kind support for uh, today's presentation is provided by Parks Canada. Um, you may notice um, that there's a papers floating around. Those are evaluation forms. If you don't mind filling those out, there's a basket on the table. And if you put it in there, you can grab a cookie. <laughs> um, and then we can report back to our funders too, and, and we can come back to McCord soon. This is a beautiful facility, so it's really nice to have to be here. Um, oh, and I've got Maggie's file. I didn't memorize that, sorry. <laughs> 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 it's a long time ago. We, did, we were trying to get here in November, um, and it finally worked out to get here in March, so I'm glad we've got a good turnout. So I'm really um, excited to hear Maggie talk today about safety. Have you had trouble getting the book? No, <laughs> I think it was two busy schedules. <laughs> that was the issue. <laughs> so, Maggie is the ecologist team leader at Grasslands National Park, and she works with her team to develop and implement grazing, restoration, care, and invasive plant management programs with a focus on the species at risk recovery. And before joining Grasslands National Park, she worked with producers in southwest Saskatchewan through the Species at Risk Partnership on Agricultural Land, or SARPOL program, and as an auditor for Audubon's Bird Friendly Beef program. Maggie earned her doctorate degree from the University of Nebraska, where her research focused on the relationships between ranch management and wildlife habitat. And Maggie and her husband's family ranch south of McCord. So, with that, I'll turn it over to Maggie. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to get this queued up here. <laughs> yeah, so I'm pretty excited to talk in my hometown. I've done just one other thing here and related to species at risk. It's a workshop I did a few years ago now, actually. Um, I don't know. Is that better? It's fine. Yeah, it's it's good. Good. Oh, sure. I see the... Yeah, just, um, <laughs> you don't need to see that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm super excited. Um, I was looking at the posts that Caitlin shared on Facebook for these talks. I saw them, I don't know how many times, show up on Facebook. But I looked at the comments on a couple of them, and a few people commented that they grew up seeing sage grouse in their pastures. One of the, I did some Facebook stalking, sorry. Um, one of the commenters was from Marone, um, which is just north of here. Another commenter was from Burwood, I believe, which is east in the, the Big Money watershed. Um, so that's how far that the sage grouse used to occur. I'll show you some range maps. Um, my husband's father even mentioned that he used to see sage grouse in his pasture, and even people in this room tonight have mentioned to me it, that they used to see sage grouse. So um, I think sage grouse are a pretty iconic species. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to, uh, before I get into my presentation, uh, just some acknowledgments. There's a whole swap of people that work on sage grouse, both inside and outside the park. Um, there's a lot of people contributing, um, funding, manpower, woman power, um, research. There's just this really 
awesome group of people working to recover sage grouse inside and outside of Grass and Central Park. Um, so I first want to talk about the species itself, the greater sage grouse. Um, and I thought a good way to kind of set the mood would be to show you a video. Hopefully this works. Um, it looks like it's partially open. Um, hopefully it will keep losing. So this is um, a clip from the Sagebrush C, which is a series that PBS, uh, the Public Broadcasting Service in the U.S., um, had up on the internet that I found. At daybreak, yes. our male is already at the lick. He's been here every day for the past three weeks. Weaker males have dropped out, leaving only those with staying power. He takes his place on a small rise, a spot he's fought hard to secure. A female steps on to the lick and begins her inspection. Important 
for the birds to be able to see predators coming and to also see their competitors and to see females coming onto the lek. Um, so that kind of sparsely vegetated habitat for that spring mating ritual is really important. And then once mating happens, the hens go off, find a spot to nest, lay their eggs. Uh, they'll often nest under a sagebrush plant um, because the plant offers that protection from predators, from the elements, um, both for the nest itself and for the nesting hen because they are pretty vulner vulnerable at that time. Um, then once the nest hatches, then you've got your brood rearing period. Um, young chicks are reliant very heavily on insects for the first week or so of their life. So um, what type of prairie supports lots of insects, a prairie with lots of flowers. So they'll find these habitat patches where there are really nice um, flower patches and that can support the growth of those young chicks. And then as they get a little bit older, the chicks kind of start switching and start eating more seeds. Um, and then um, coming closer to fall and then winter, they start switching their diets over to sagebrush exclusively. Um, and so over winter, you the sage grouse rely completely on sagebrush, um, they eat the leaves of the sagebrush. Um, and so they need sagebrush that's tall enough that it will not get covered up by snow in the winter time. Um, in most of Grouse National Park, our sagebrush is uh, pretty um, short compared to other types of sagebrush. So the species in grasslands is called silver sagebrush, it's Artemisia canna. In uh, the southern range, so just south of the border in Montana, it starts to switch to Wyoming big sage and other types of sagebrush, which can grow quite a bit taller. Um, I did manage accidentally to find an example of a really tall silver sagebrush. So that's me standing there. I don't know if the people in the back can see it, but that's the top of the sagebrush. So that sagebrush, actually, I have a picture of Rin standing next to it too, and it's taller than Rin, so I know that that sagebrush plant is more than six feet tall, and the trunk of it is about this big around. Um, so I'm not really sure why that plant was able to get so big. It was protected from grazing for a long time. It's just kind of outside of a fence, um, and it also had a stack of bales close to it that maybe allowed the snow to build up every winter, giving it more moisture to get a good start in the spring. Um, so I just thought that was that's really interesting that the silver sagebrush is potentially capable of getting taller than we're used to seeing in grass and such. Sure. So if they survive nesting, the chicks grow up healthy and strong, they survive over the winter, then they can get back to breeding in the spring and the cycle starts over again. So you can see that sage grouse really do require a wide variety of habitat types um, to survive and thrive in our grassland landscape. Um, so, talk a little bit about um, what the historical landscape might have looked like. Um, thinking about sage grouse uh, for the um, evolved in this huge grassland landscape over thousands of years. Um, there would have been large herds of bison grazing that were impacting the landscape. Um, there would have been wildfires. Um, indigenous peoples would have also been using fire as a tool to manage bison. Um, and so all those interacting factors were kind of creating that quilt work of grassland types to support sage grouse across that large landscape. Um, even things like droughts, um, severe winters could maybe impact the local population, but because the landscape was so huge and there were sage grouse across such a large range that if a population in, say, western Nebraska were to blink out, other birds from different locations could then repopulate that area. So you have a really dynamic population across the landscape, but overall stable, um, just shifting with changes in the weather and changes um, in bison grazing, wildfires, and all those things. So it was this, just this really big patchwork of habitat types that supported a stable, um, healthy sagebrush and sage grouse population. Um, so, having that kind of in the back of your mind, we can start to think about what has caused the birds to decline. Um, one of the most obvious things is probably the conversion of um, prairie grasslands to uh, agriculture, row crop agriculture. Um, so the map on the left 
shows um, basically the conversion risk of the um, Great Plains of North America. So anything in red is showing you that that had a very high suitability for um, agriculture conversion. Um, and it, anything in green is showing you kind of these areas were not very suitable, and that's based on things like soil type, slope, rockiness. Um, and so that's kind of a, a, a high level analysis of the entire Great Plains. So if you look at the map on the right then, the red's all gone. That's today. Um, basically, the soils that were suitable for conversion to agriculture have all been converted to agriculture. There's not much red, if any, left on that map. Um, so we have lost a lot of our grasslands across the Great Plains. Um, in Saskatchewan, the most recent estimate I've seen is we've got about 15%, 1.5 of our former grassland range. Um, so that's quite a significant loss of prairies. Um, and sometimes I think farmers can feel blamed for this, but I think it's important to point out that obviously it, there was a convergence of um, really important and influential social and economic factors happening over the past hundred years that really drove this conversion of prairie to cropland. Um, some other threats that are in play now. Um, so even on grasslands that haven't been converted, so native prairie, there's still some threats at play. Um, fencing is one of them. Fencing is obviously crucial for the way we manage our grazing. Um, unfortunately, fencing can be problematic for different wildlife species. So sage grouse can fly into the fence, they break their neck and die. Um, they could also maybe break a wing and then that makes them more vulnerable, vulnerable to predators. Um, so those can have a negative impact on the population. Um, roads being put in, um, obviously you, you probably don't know of any bird that has ever survived a collision with your vehicle. I know I haven't. Um, and interestingly, uh, grouse species, because they do like that kind of open habitat, some of them will choose to do their spring mating on a road. Um, I don't know how common it is necessarily with sage grouse, but I've already started seeing sharp-tailed grouse congregating on roads this year. So just a friendly reminder, slow down when you're driving. Um, these birds need all the help they can get, so if we can slow down a little bit and prevent us from hitting some of these birds, that would be awesome. Um, another threat that's ongoing is um, development of oil and gas wells. So again, lecking grounds are super important for that initial mating. Uh, in the springtime, um, oil and gas wells can create chronic noise. Um, if you could hear the video play, you could hear those noises that were coming from the birds, and oil and gas wells can interfere with that um, important component of their mating. Um, and they also contribute to fragmentation of habitat, um, increased road traffic, so all those things kind of converge to um, pose a problem for sage grouse, even in native grasslands. Um, some other things that these, these are kind of components of the sage grouse uh, life that has, have always been there. Um, they're, they're not new, but they're getting worse because the population is so small. Um, so extreme weather events in Boundary, a couple years ago we had a really nasty hailstorm. Um, from Some people from Boundary might be annoyed that I say this, but I'm glad that it went through Boundary instead of a little further south um, because it could have potentially wiped out an entire population of sage grouse in the park. Um, no bird is going to survive getting hit by a hailstone the size of a baseball. Um, extreme winters, I've, I mentioned this, the importance of that tall sagebrush. Um, in grasslands National Park, a lot of our sagebrush, sagebrush is pretty short. Um, so if we were to have an extreme winter where that sagebrush did get covered up, it could potentially again wipe out an entire population of birds. Um, severe droughts, so those chicks really need those forbs, um, and forbs are often found in wet meadow type habitats, um, which can support the growth of those forbs. If we get a severe drought, then all of a sudden we lose some of that habitat that's crucial for sage grouse to grow up and enter into that breeding population the next year. Um, and so some of these things, 
many of you have probably noticed our weather seems to be getting more extreme, more extreme droughts, more extreme storms. I mean, we had a tornado south of Wentworth a couple years ago. That's pretty unusual. Um, so these things seem to be getting uh, more erratic, which is problematic for these birds. Um, lastly, again, because their population is so small, um, things like predators have gotten more impactful. Um, we've got a lot of signs in Grasslands Grass National Park, a lot of our roads outside of the park, uh, fences, um, power poles, all of these things are things that um, allow predators to perch, avian predators, and then that allows them to kind of scan that landscape looking for anything to eat. And sage grouse, they're the largest grouse in North America, make a pretty tasty meal for these predators. So um, those, those things are all problematic for sage grouse. Um, so talking a little bit about predators, um, specifically in the park, we wanted to understand a little bit more about what was going on in Grasslands National Park with our predators. So one of the strategies for looking at impacts of um, different things on nesting birds is to use artificial nests. So basically we take chicken eggs from the store, put them in where we think out on the landscape there might be a sage grouse nest, and then we monitor those nests. So um, there's a picture here of one of our, where is it, staff putting up a camera. So basically we would monitor that, that artificial nest and then once it gets destroyed we can then collect that camera and see what was the culprit. Um, so in, in our case, so we put out artificial, eight artificial nests in 2016 and 2017. Uh, just under half of them got destroyed. So that left us with about 40 nests to be able to um, look at to see what was um, causing them to get destroyed. Um, and it was interesting as well that we found that the west block was different from the east block. So the west block had a lot more of its artificial nests destroyed than the east block. Um, the west block is quite a bit more developed in terms of um, our tourism infrastructure. There's still some existing ranches operating in the park as part of our grazing management program. Um, so there's maybe more um, suitable habitat for predators to uh, uh, take advantage of in the west block than in the east block. Um, and interestingly, so this graph basically shows the three different types of things that were found destroying nests. Corvids, which are your ravens, crows, magpies. I think in this case it was mostly magpies. Um, they were the most um, problematic for stage grouse nests. They destroyed just under half of the nests that were destroyed. Um, and then we've got coyotes destroyed, maybe 20% of those, and then badgers were um, destroyed very few of the nests. So those were our kind of predators, and that cues us into maybe those avian predators are having the most impact on our sage grouse population in the West Block. Um, so the next one that has been identified as a threat um, in the recovery strategy, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, is grazing. Um, this is maybe shocking to some of you because grazing is actually the most compatible land use for sage grouse. Um, the recovery strategy specifically says, I'll just read it, degradation of vegetative cover from grazing levels inappropriate for sage grouse. Um, so grazing can be a threat if it's not managed well for sage grouse, but it can also be a huge benefit. I was actually just reading some um, research today that showed basically nests found in areas with grazing did far better than nests found in areas without grazing. Um, so that just speaks to the importance of grazing and grazing management as a benefit to sage grouse. Um, I think some of the components that are maybe problematic are, again, the fencing that we need to use for grazing management. Um, there's a lot of evidence from the states that people would do their best to convert sagebrush grasslands to just grasslands. Obviously cows don't eat sagebrush, so they would, there's even papers on it published. How do we get rid of our sagebrush? You go out and spray it, you go out and plow it, you go plant your crest of wheat grass, and then you got your grazing for your cows. So um, in that sense, it was definitely a threat, maybe contributed to some of that conversion. 
uh, of habitat. I haven't heard as much of that conversion of sagebrush to just grass in Canada, but I've definitely heard anecdotally that it was happening a little bit here. People wanted to reduce the cover of sagebrush to increase the cover of grass for grazing, which is obviously um, if your livelihood is based on grazing cows, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I think it's important to not think of these threats individually one at a time, but to kind of consider them as a whole and why, even though one of them maybe wouldn't have been a problem, they're all happening at the same time on the same places. So I basically just uh, created a map here. The outline shows the south of the divide region, um, Crossings National Park over there in green. Um, and so you've got all these threats happening. You've got initially land conversion happening. So I'm just going to kind of walk through some things that might be happening across the landscape which are negatively impacting sage grouse. Um, so land conversion, you've got homesteaders coming in, starting to convert that land, um, slowly losing native prairie to cropland conversion. Um, just a caveat, these aren't actually, this is just hypothetical, I haven't put this on areas that are actually crop, or, yeah, because you might see something that you know is native, but I've blocked it out. So anyways, um, so this is happening slowly over time. Um, putting up fences as homesteaders come in, um, putting up power poles, building roads, all these things happening slowly over time, and you start ending up with these big chunks of the landscape that are just no longer suitable to support sage grouse populations. Um, and eventually, uh, with that impact, I talked about that dynamic population that was one area could link out, but then it would be repopulated from some other area. Um, as we're losing prairie, those populations that could potentially be um, repopulating some area are also getting lost. So we just end up with this, basically this whole area is no longer has any sage grouse in it that we know of anyways. Um, and we're left now with just two blocks, two uh, lone populations in Grasslands National Park, East Block and West Block. Um, we don't really know exactly why. I guess, um, yeah, so we don't know exactly why they're left here because there is native prairie elsewhere. There were historical populations. Um, I'm leaving off Alberta. There's a population in Alberta. Um, Grasslands National Park is one of the bigger areas of native prairie. Um, there's native prairie around us. Uh, there's not very many roads. It's kind of sparsely populated. So all those factors could have contributed to allowing the population of sage grouse to kind of persist there where they weren't able to persist anywhere else. Um, okay, so let's look at the numbers related to that. Unfortunately, we don't have the information going back 100 years um, before that uh, kind of major landscape change with crop conversion started. Um, this starts in 1996. Um, so in greater sage grouse in Canada, total males at lex, so the lecking uh, period in the spring is a really useful time for biologists, <coughs> excuse me, biologists to go and count sage grouse because they are congregating, congregating there for breeding. So it can give us a really good index of the population. So 1996, we had over 250 males at lex, so roughly double that, maybe there's 500 birds in Canada. And then you can see this steady decline um, and they're only now occupying about 7% of the historical range in Canada. So you can see that um, across their range, there's other areas where they're also kind of really have shrunk down. Washington, um, Alberta, and Saskatchewan are the two probably most dramatic range restrictor constrictions for sage grouse. Um, <coughs> drilling down a little bit to Saskatchewan, uh, I took these numbers straight out of the uh, recovery strategy. So in Saskatchewan, there were a high of 873 males in 1988. We're down to just 16 in 2019. Um, so 1988 was the first range-wide survey conducted of all the known lex in Saskatchewan. Um, so that's why 
we can go back to that day and say there were this many males. Um, in 1988, there were 42 active lefts, and now we're down to just two in 2019. Um, and both of the known lefts are in Grasses National Park. So again, you can kind of see that this gray shape.